Yes, and so we're going to go from deep tech to health tech. Uh, our next topic here on the backstage is connected health, how digital healthcare empowers individuals. So without further ado, let's introduce the panelists. So we will have um, an experienced technology journalist, the senior edi edi editor from Recode, Ina Fried. And then we will have a guy who <laughs> he said that if uh, he were to introduce himself, he would still say that he's an entrepreneur. But he was, when he was a bit younger, he coded games for the Commodore 64 back in the days. And uh, right now, today, he is uh, the chairman of Nokia, the chairman and founder of F-Secure. He's Risto Silasma. <laughs> Then we will have um, a guy who graduated in Denmark and has worked uh, for a long time for Nokia, for 14 years in venture capital and invested management. He's an experienced guy. He comes and represents Nokia Growth Partners, and he, his name is Bo Ilso. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and then next up also Marcus Gneers from Leipzig and Ida Tin from the Clue app. So let's welcome onto the stage Ina, Risto, Bu, Marcus, and Ida. Great. Well, I'm really glad to be here. Uh, it's my first time doing something in the round. I like it. Um, so yeah, everyone, I guess, find a seat. So um, we're talking about a topic that I think everyone's interested in, but nobody really feels comfortable talking about it. So let's just say none of us are health experts. None of us eat what we should. None of us exercise as much as we should. But it's, it's really a field that's changing a tremendous amount. When I think about the industries that are really changing the most, I think about transportation and healthcare. Um, and, you know, we have a really great group here, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Um, it's just such a, such a broad topic. So I thought what might be helpful first is for the panelists to each share a little bit about sort of not just who they are, but what, what they bring to this topic, how they're approaching it. Because Nobody's going to solve health. Nobody's going to, you know, cure everything. Everyone comes at this. They've focused on a problem or two. Um, so we're joined by some folks that are doing it on the product side, some uh, bigger companies that are investing. And obviously, there's no bigger company in this country uh, and certainly in the slush crowd than Nokia. So we have the chairman of Nokia, Risto. Do you want to kind of frame how you guys got into this business and how you guys are thinking about health? Sure. So, the mic on? Great. You know, entrepreneurship is all about fixing major problems. We are attracted to, to big issues, and there's nothing bigger than health. And just to put that into perspective, all of you look around you to the two people next to you. One of the three of you has hypertension. You have high blood pressure, and you will suffer from that. One other of the three is pre-hypertension. So you are progressing towards having high blood pressure. And with a very simple gadget, and we have clinical proof of this, we could save one of the three of you. Think about that. This is not magic. This is not any, any new, real, high-tech, difficult stuff. It's very simple stuff. And look at the face next to you. Maybe that's the face, that's the person who could be saved with really easy to use consumer technology that will help you avoid dying from a stroke. And that's what's driving, I think, all of us. Because it's the opportunity, it's something we, it's a duty, we have to do it. 
and you, Nokia wasn't necessarily in the health business a few years ago. Can you just briefly kind of share, how did you make the decision? You know, as a board, you were trying to figure out Nokia was exiting some areas. They were looking at where are the areas they still want to be. I think a lot of people, even here, probably don't know. There's, you know, there were the several businesses of Nokia, the phone business got sold. Most of Nokia is a network equipment builder. And then there's this kind of smaller segment of the company, Nokia Technologies, that's kind of an open field of where you guys see a chance to invest. Why, why healthcare and when did that become clear to you that that was a place to go? Yeah, Nokia is a 151 year old company, but it's also three years old because we reinvented the company about three years ago to the extent that out of our over 100,000 employees, less than 1% carried a Nokia badge three years ago. Think about that. This very large company has been completely reinvented during the last three years. And that's a, that's a wonderful opportunity. So you can think about what is the world going to be like in 2025 and what kind of a company would we like to be in 2025? And then with an almost clean slate, you can start designing how do you start now to be what you would want to be in 2025? That's what startups do. <coughs> they dream about what they want to be in 10 years. These 150-year-old companies rarely get to do that. So health technology was one of the first things we started thinking about already when we were negotiating with Microsoft on the possibility of offloading our handset business to Microsoft and then getting the funding and the opportunity to start redesigning the company. Thanks, Risto. And Ida, you, know, you guys come at this, you know, not from the big company perspective. Um, explain a little bit about what Clue does, and uh, I think you have a, a little excitement to share with us as well. Yeah, absolutely. Mike, working? Yes. Yeah, so Clue is a health tracking app for women to understand what's going on in their bodies which is a pretty central thing to understand when you have this biology. Um, so we basically digitize reproductive health and turn it into insights so that people can basically manage life. And yeah, it's a super happy day because we have just closed our Series B and NGP is our lead investor. So we're very excited about working with some great Scandinavians, some slightly crazy Finns. I really love the Finns. Um, and, uh, and also the international team. Uh, we have also raised money from our current investors, um, Union Square Ventures, Mosaic, Christoph Mayer, Brigitte Mohn, and others, um, and others, uh, new investors too. So that's exciting because it's basically showing that the world is starting to realize that a big part of health is actually female health, and it is something that you need to put special attention to because we have different needs than people without that biology. Um, and it's a great day as well for Berlin because I think it's wonderful that we can start showing that we can build good big companies out of Berlin and out of Europe, which I personally feel is an important thing uh, in the world right now. And how much did you guys raise? Yeah, so we have raised 20 million euros. Okay, well, 20 million euros? Yeah. All right, well, I need to tweet that out, so. Uh... Yeah. Let me uh, tweet you. that out. <laughs> While I'm doing that, Bo, you, you are one of the investors in Clue. Talk about how, where digital health and health fit into what you do at uh, Nokia NGP. Yeah, so uh, maybe just a few words of background. So NGP has been around for 10 years. We have one financial backer, which is Nokia. We are a venture capital fund, and we try to make the best investments we can in the regions where we are. So it's India, China, Europe, and um, the US. Uh, we are a team of uh, 13 investment professionals around these uh, regions. And one of our goals is Clue is now a very big service in some Western European markets. But of course, there's a, a large population in India. There is a large population in China. There's a large population in South America where Clue is already present that also need the Clue services. Um, so that's really great to be part of the team with uh, Ida and Hans, and it's our fourth investment in Berlin. Um, we, we think about health alongside also with, uh, with Nokia in basically in three phases. So the first phase is uh, try to stay well as long as you can. 
right? Eat well, which is why we invested in LifeSum. Um, look after your uh, basic health before you get sick and try to uh, get less sick if, if you can using technology and services that are engaging. The second piece is to manage uh, chronic, uh, chronic diseases that some of us, unfortunately, are subject to. And, and the third piece is really also better managing care. So once people uh, get in the hospital or to maybe get them out of the hospital faster. Um, so those are really sort of the three buckets that we're looking at, uh, in, at as an investor. And uh, we will announce uh, later in December one more investment, which is more focused at managing uh, a chronic disease uh, and giving tools and guidance for, uh, for individuals to manage a chronic disease and health. Um, the other piece we're very much looking at, because we come from a world of investing around mobile internet, is really to bring some of that engagement uh, and gamification that we have seen in consumer services. And healthcare is a very, very large industry. Uh, the only way to deal with cost in the long term is to use technology, but also is really to entice us as users uh, to engage with the services in a more interesting way than what we can do today. Oh, and that's definitely a topic. Sorry, is my mic on? Yeah. That's definitely a topic I think we want to explore more is how do you bring sort of gamification and other methods to change behavior. Marcus, you guys also come at this from the wellness space. Talk a little bit about how you guys see apps like yours, and explain your app, playing a role in, in healthier lives. Yeah, I think, I think a, a big problem with health is that we're all human and we have flaws. And uh, with LifeSum, we try to create personalized navigation for health and lifestyle improvement. And using the new sensor technology that is coming, as well as, how do you say, mainstreamification, if that is a word, of things like blood, DNA, and microbiome, and then try to design fantastic user experience that drive users to want to live better rather than telling people what they should do, which is the traditional approach from the health world where you have products that remind you how, of how bad at life you are. And we think that uh, we can create something that drives positive change and sort of empowers the user and uh, using the data to really allow people to control their life. I mean, that, it seems like both you... Thank you. I need a lot of help, but my... <laughs> you know, I think both of you... I'm gonna use this, sorry about that. Um, I think both you, Ida, and Marcus, you come at this from the wellness space, not from the clinical health space, but from empowering users to, or people, to you know, take, take ownership of their own health. I, I want you to talk some about the advantages of that because clearly, you know, consumer apps, you can do things that are different. And then I'm also gonna challenge you on some of the areas, the limits of where wellness comes in. But, but talk about, you know, why a consumer focused approach makes sense for digital health and then I'll I'll skewer you with some of the challenges. Uh, Marcus, maybe you'll start, and then I'll give you the mic back. Yeah, I, th I think with the consumer focus, we, cr we, create, we have to create, people, create products that people want to use. And I think also uh, it becomes a pr pretty much different approach, where for us it's about creating mass market products that help a lot of people, and that means uh, you can't be correct at everything, but if you drive positive change and sort of use the fact that uh, no one wants to sort of become sick, no one wants to be unhealthy, but you need to create, use the mechanics and experience that we have from other digital products to drive users and drive motivation. Because I think we come at it from nutrition, which is the data side is still fairly unfigured out, or at least right now, scientific community is questioning a lot, and we're learning more about how uh, personalization is key. Like health is different for everyone, and you should everyone shouldn't eat the same diet. And uh, I think uh, I think for, for for us, it's like 
taking like gaming mechanics and good con like consumer digital product best practice and then putting it putting it into play into something that is very serious for mankind. So I, I do want to get back to you, but on gamification specific came up, is there any examples that you see of this really working? You know, I, it's much talked about this idea that, you know, if we gamify how people will do better. I hear about it all the time, challenging other people. Now I have to say I'm a big Pokemon Go player and it has made me walk more. But to me that's probably the biggest change in my out part of this, are we still trying to figure that out? Has anyone figured it out? I think, I th I think the word gamification, I'm a bit allergic to it, actually is applied psychology. Mm -hmm. It's like, what is, what is good user experience? And applying that so it becomes delightful and you get people to want to do things. Risto. There, there are studies done on people who, who are counting steps. If they start sharing, their, the steps they take on a daily basis. That statistically increases the number of steps they take every day quite significantly. Because we are such emotional animals that if we know that somebody else knows how many steps I took, we will take more steps. So that's not gamification and, and as such, company, but it works. The company that Nokia bought, I, don't, I never know, is it Withings? Why Withings. 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 <laughs> they, they had a thing where the scale would tweet out their yeah. weight. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was always better, it helped the person, but it was very boring for everyone that wasn't the person. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so I, I agree with Mark, because I also, I don't like the word gamification because it means a lot of different things. I think one simple example is A-B testing, right? I mean, Ida does it, Marcus does it. Why do they do it? Because they want to have more users on the platform and they want also users to spend more time generally. And that's a very simple mechanism that really comes from the gaming world, right? How do I get users engaged? How do I get them to the next level? How do I do it so that it's easy to come in and it's not too complicated, right? Try to go to a hospital provider and say, let's do some A-B testing in your hospital, right? They look yeah. like you just fell down from the moon. But th th that's the mindset, right, that, that comes in when uh, when uh, Ida and Marcus are designing new services to make it more engaging, right? And, you know, talk about how much of your motivation was that this needed to get more attention from the consumer side versus just women's health in general not getting attention. I mean, I don't know how many people know, but, you know, with most diseases, all they test is how men, often white men, <laughs> react to certain drugs. Women are you know, it's only in recent years that they've even said, oh, maybe we should see what impact this has on women. Talk about what inspired you and, and how, how important it is in general for technology to be made, especially health technology for women. Yeah, so when I started thinking about this about eight years ago, I was really puzzled that we can put people on the moon, but a woman still doesn't know what day she can become pregnant which is a pretty good data point to have, right? Every time you have sex, you kind of have to navigate that question. So I think it's just incredible that female health has been so overlooked for so many years, especially given how much money we spend on this. It's a huge part of public and private health spending. Um, I think as we enter into this time where AI is starting to you know, be an important part of how we take care of health, it's increasingly important that this technology is built by people who actually experience that part of life. And, not, and, and again, there are no norms. I think that one of the really important things that men have to understand is that they are not the norm. And the point is, there is no norm. I'm also not the norm. When we look at our user base, it's so diverse. You cannot imagine the, the range of life situation, life stages, races, ages. Like it's, it's so diverse that we need to start deeply understand diversity as we build products, especially in health, because it's so close to heart, emotionally and physically. And, and I promised I would challenge you all, and so of course I will. So obviously the consumer side can bring all the things that are great about the tech industry, fast moving, rapid iteration, understanding of what drives individuals. How much are you limited by 
sort of the clinical and the regulatory regimes. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the world where we have to live in. So at Nokia, we start from both ends. We start from patient monitoring and then the consumer side, and then we bridge. So we work with many leading medical research facilities, big hospitals on clinical health. Some of our devices are FDA approved, many are not, but the sensors are the same. This is what happened in the military, the commercial off the shelf COTS technology, because actually it's better. The high volumes lead to better technology. So and that's what the consumer market will bring. And the hospitals are using the same sensors. So we can have actually the same quality of measurements taken at home with consumer products. And it's going to be only habit that will prevent or history, tradition, that will prevent the medical community from utilizing that data. But we can bridge that. And Marcus, how important is it to to what you do and Ida to what you do to have a bridge to the clinical world. I mean, there's all this data that your customers have and yet when they go to the doctor, the doctor is not going to pay a ton of attention no. to any of it because it wasn't officially gathered. No, and, and you, have, you have that said, but it's also healthcare is fantastic and doctors are really good, but the problem is you need to be sick to get access to them. Not like, like Bo mentioned earlier that, and also Risto was talking about, uh, it's, it's, it's how you live leads to getting access to doctors. But I think with, uh, with new sensors coming and data gathered, it's gonna change the relationship between the patient and the doctor from having historically where the doctor has been like a head priest that has talked down to the patient, suddenly we're gonna be able to have dialogues where you have the same set of data and uh, the patient gets respected to be smart and you can discuss how you should live and hopefully as a person that is not sick that you can be able to get quality adv advice and also get more understanding about yourself and how you should live from people that are more qualified than someone that has read six issues of men's health. Can I make a quick comment on that? In, in China, there used to be villages with their own village doctors where the healthy villagers paid the doctor. The sick didn't have to pay. So the whole incentive structure was turned around. The healthy people rewarded the doctor. And that's the sea, sea change we need to see implemented in our healthcare systems globally. And the, the devices and the systems we are developing can help in making that happen. We need to start rewarding the medical community for health. And obviously, you know, I come from the country that's probably the furthest behind in that. The U.S. is just dipping a toe, uh, and we'll see if that toe gets revoked, but just dipping a toe into not just publicly financed healthcare, which is something we could all use, but also the idea of paying insurance companies, even in the private sector, paying for health versus yeah. paying for things do you see a day, uh, any of you, Bo, uh, Marcus, Ida, where, where you guys are paid by health providers because you're making a difference? Is that on your radar, or do you see it always as the consumer is buying this because they want it? I actually made an investment into a healthcare company that has that business model. So there's a fixed fee for all members, and when they go and see a doctor, it's a cost for the healthcare provider when they don't have to come and see the doctor, the company makes a profit. Mm -hmm. So they actually invest a lot in ensuring that the, the members are healthy. It's like Kaiser Permanente in the US, right. exactly the same model. Yep. Uh, for those that don't know, the way Kaiser works is it's both an insurer and the provider. So unlike the rest of our healthcare system, they actually have an incentive to keep people healthy, whereas it doesn't really work with the rest. But, but I am curious, Bo, in terms of the companies you're investing in, Marcus and Ida, where do you see the clinical handoff and do you see a greater role over time between you and clinical providers? And for Bo, the companies you invest in, but oh, Ida. Go ahead, Ida. Um, yeah, I do see that we will, you know, start looking into that. We've not just yet, but yes, is the answer to your question. For us, I think interfacing with research institution is kind of our, our first step towards clinical. 
um, because the amount of data we have now is, of course, magnitudes different from what was available when the textbooks was written, right? We actually need to rewrite textbooks, and the data we have can do that, and we want to do that with the best researchers in the world. We're working with Stanford, Howard, Oxford, and others to do this work. Marcus, do you see a handoff at some point where I, your I, data can it, be used it, 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 ha it has to. I think we need to move in that direction. And looking at US healthcare spending is increasing with, at a fantastically high speed. Same time, uh, uh, same time life expectancy is going down. There is something wrong with the system. And I think we're seeing from uh, the research world and the health world in general that more and more people are starting to question it. We have health data from 16 million people and at a level that I think has not been looked at from the research community before. So I think like, I think for me here, it's like open invitation to anyone that wants to sort of do research on big data sets, come to our office and let's play together and let's try to create something that is wonderful. Because I think health needs to change and with the new sensors that come, it's like the possibility to do increased level of personalization and treating you as an individual and not as a group of patients. Have you already oh, done that with our people? Uh, we're in the process of doing it with... We'll, we'll be in your uh, office tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad I could bridge that relationship. Yeah. So, Bo, when you're looking at investing, how do you... How sophisticated does it need to be? <laughs> we have to interrupt the discussions. Oh. Any f finalizing words? No. Thank you. <laughs> or maybe... We're, we're a bit over time <laughs> if we... If it's okay. <laughs> yes, but... Thank you, everyone. Okay. Go Thank ahead. you. So much. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Marcus. Marcus, Ida, and Ina. Let's give a big hand to the, all, to the whole panel. Come Thank on. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy sorry, that sorry we're guys. talking about. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so happy that we're talking about health on this stage as well.